Shalom and welcome to this special and most timely Talking Memory program, Defending Holocaust Scholarship. My name is Nadine Shachar and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as a guide and an educator. I want to thank the Lester and Sally Enten Faculty of Humanities and the Institute for the History of Polish Jewry at Tel Aviv University, as well as the Rabin Chair Forum at the George Washington University for collaborating with the Ghetto Fighters House on today's program. And now I would like to invite Egal Cohen, the CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, to give the opening remarks. Egal. Thanks. Shalom and welcome. I am proud and honored to ask you, Professor Jan Gavovsky, once again in our Talking Memory Lecture Series. We are proud that you have chosen to speak from our podium and discuss your scholarly work and the moral implications that stand be behind it. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your strong and great friendship with the Ghetto Fighters House. Thank you, Professor Natalia Alexion, for your contribution to this most relevant subject and for our continuing dialogue. And thank you, Professor Javi Dreyfus of the Tel Aviv University and the Institute for History of Polish Jewelry for your role tonight and your continuing support of the Ghetto Fighters House. We are here today for a very important and special program beyond the particular subject matter. This is a moral statement. We at the Ghetto Fighters House believe that we must stand for academic freedom, for freedom of speech and against any government's attempt to dictate a national narrative. We know that every society and every culture is diverse. There are differences and sometimes even contradictory ideas. We're obligated to shed light on the inspiring of and moral aspects of our past and present. But we must uphold our integrity and, we, and be brave enough to also look at the less favorable side in my opinion, this is the way to educate and more importantly, to be role models for the young generation. We believe in educational and value-based outlook. Thank you, Medin, for your important role in this e event. And thank you to the hundreds of participants from all, from all over the world for participating in the Talking Memory programs. I, wa I want to wish us all a meaningful and fascinating event. Thank you. Thank you, Igal. And now I would like to invite Professor Javi Dragos to also say a few words. Thank you, Maydin. And I too want to welcome this impressive audience and uh, that is here with us today and welcome you all on behalf of the Department of Jewish History and the Institute of History of Polish Jewry at Tel Aviv University. We are so pleased to participate in this meeting of the online lecture Syria, Talking Memory, organized by Ghetto Fighters House, which will host today two wonderful scholars, Professor Jan Gabowski and Professor Natalia Alexion, for a discussion on defending Holocaust scholarship. The persecution and conviction in Poland of Professor Barbara Engel King and Professor Jan Grabowski, two world-renowned historians of the Holocaust, won, and rightly so, widespread international condemnation. Finding those scholars guilty of libel regarding a passage in a groundbreaking publication they edited, the latest notes, is a grave sign for academic freedom, as Eagle said. Understanding the current situation of Holocaust studies in Poland is important for us, not only as members of the same academic community seeking fact-based knowledge and struggling together against attempts to force a distorted historical narrative. It is also relevant to us because of the Israeli involvement in supporting the amendment of the law accepted during the months, summer months of 2018 which encouraged filing such lawsuits. 
Hearing and reading the implicit and explicit attacks on history and on historians by various official agencies of the Polish authorities makes this discussion even more relevant than ever for all of us. And we thank the Ghetto Fighters House for this cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Javi, for your uh, very important uh, words. So now I uh, would like to introduce our two guests. Uh, professor Natalia Alekshun is Professor of Modern Jewish History at the Graduate School of Jewish Studies at Toro College, New York. And Professor Jan Gobowski is a Professor of History at the University of Ottawa. And uh, his interests focus on the Holocaust in Poland and more specifically on the relations between Jews and Poles during the war. And I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to hand over the platform to our two guests. Thank you. Thank you, Medine, and thank you, Igal, and thank you, Javi. Um, it is my honor to be here today, to be here with Jan. And Javi already um, got us started in trying to frame, or frame and contextualize uh, the situation that is uh, extremely uh, difficult and with uh, very far-reaching uh, potential repercussions uh, for um, Jan and Barbara personally, but for Holocaust research uh, more broadly. And I want to just um, give you a sense of uh, where I hope uh, we could take this conversation by uh, citing a title of an article that uh, Jan uh, wrote together with uh, Jonathan Brandt, the uh, director of uh, EVA Institute of Jewish Re for Jewish Research in New York, titled, uh, and it's a great title, uh, When Writing History Becomes a Crime. Now, this is a wonderful title for an online uh, article, except that it has um, dramatic uh, contemporary implications, because as Javi mentioned, uh, the court did find uh, both Professor Grabowski and Professor Engelking uh, guilty of, uh, quote, disseminating false information. And this is um, something that I want to get us started with, uh, but then also uh, talk about uh, how this trial and this conviction uh, is part of a much broader campaign uh, against a particular kind of scholarship and peddling a uh, very useful vision of the history of the Holocaust uh, with all kinds of scholarly, uh, moral, ethical, uh, political um, implications. So if, uh, and I will not pretend that uh, Jan and I, uh, when we meet, call each other uh, professors, so I'll just uh, cut this given that we're in Israel and uh, start uh, asking Jan uh, where, we, where we stand. Uh, where is this trial, the conviction, the sentence, and what does it mean for the broader question? And then we'll take it from there. Sure, <clears throat> sure, Natalia, thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you, Madin, thank you, Igal, thank you, Javi. And most of all, thank you to all these hundreds of, partic of participants who are joining us online. I am very humbled and impressed, so thank you for your time. Uh, so greetings from Warsaw, Poland, uh, and uh, to answer, to start us going in this conversation. Mm, well, um, as you have mentioned, uh, the, um, the Warsaw District Court uh, um, uh, well, uh, sentenced us, or rather, uh, in its uh, in its judgment, found us uh, guilty um, of disseminating this wrong uh, information, and um, uh, um, obligated us to uh, apologize uh, to a widow who filed the lawsuit. Uh, now, at this stage, we are we. I am speaking about uh, me and. Uh, uh, the Macaw accused Professor Engel King and uh, our lawyers are still waiting for the, uh, the written justification of the sentence because you cannot file an appeal uh, before before the written justification has been rendered in court. Um, uh, but the problem is, of course, that uh, from for those of you who know something more about the story, as you know, it is not a simple lawsuit of a, of a, of a person that wants to defend her, um, let's say, um, uh, reputation. Uh, it is a lawsuit uh, 
uh, richly subsidized by, by the Polish state through the, uh, through the proxy, through the, through the institutions, organizations, in this case, um, uh, an organization called the Fortress of Defense of Good Name of Polish Nation. Uh, in any case, um, the, the problem is that as soon as this, uh, as the sentence has been announced, so basically the next day, uh, the Polish Minister of Justice, uh, uh, one Mr. Jobro, um, uh, went on record in public broadcaster, in, in, in radio and TV, um, basically praising the, uh, the sentence and uh, finding us guilty before an appeal could have been filed. And now this is a very unusual, I would say rather unique situation, that a Minister of Justice would, do, would intervene in a not final sentence of this kind. Now, given the, given the situation with Polish system of justice, which is not only under strain, which is being dismantled um, as, we, as we speak uh, by the authorities, now, what are the chances of an appeal? I really don't know. Uh, however, um, our lawyer, um, um, uh, Aleksandra gishczynska grabias and mentioned publicly that this case probably will find its uh, its way to the Stra Strasbourg Court of European European Court of Justice. So, uh, because as you mentioned, the implications it is not about uh, Grabowski, not about Engelking. It is about whether who owns history, who can write history, who cannot write history, and whether we are going to see Polish authorities rewriting the history of the Shoah according to their wishes or not. Adalia, you're mute. You're muted. I guess we need someone to intervene to unmute Natalia. Yes, I, am I? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, thank you. So apropos the implications, I want to start small. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, there is still no written uh, justification of the court's decision. But from what I, I understand, uh, the, the crew of the, uh, of the decision is based on uh, questioning uh, the um, uh, validity of uh, of a testimony uh, of a survivor. Um, so I wanted to ask, what is the future of Holocaust research in the context of uh, making Holocaust uh, survivors accounts basically uh, a priori, not trustworthy, unless they fit a particular vision of the past, and we'll come back to that vision of the past. Well, the thing is that I'm not going to get too technical here because I assume that not all hundreds of people who are joining us uh, now are interested in technicalities and uh, historical uh, details of historical methodology. However, in most general terms, what you have is a, 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 a judge basically intervening profoundly or deeply in the way in which, into the way in which historians assign meaning to archival or other oral evidence. Now, uh, the lawsuit was loaded, okay? In other words, there were very many issues at stake. For instance, uh, the plaintiff, um, uh, uh, the lawyers for the plaintiff wanted us to uh, admit that we wanted to uh, damage the pride of the Polish uh, nation in a premeditated way, that uh, that we wounded, that we basically abused the right of this individual to her um, uh, national pride and national identity. Now, uh, the judge, one has to say, dismissed these parts of lawsuit steadily and without any reservations, which is very important because one has to understand that nowadays you, what you see in Poland, and I assume in some other East European countries too, is an attempt to redefine these personal goods which a historian can wound or hurt, not to include only your honor, but to include your distant family honor or any other member of your tribe's honor, to put it this way. Your member of your Volksgemeinschaft, your national community. 
Uh, so this was so, but so 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 this has been roundly rejected, which is which is good. Okay. However, it has been a, the let's say our opponents are are continuing to push these terms to make them recognized in the civil law, which would have tremendous implications. But let's go now to this: what the judge actually, in an unwritten but oral, let's say, justification mentioned. Well, the problem here was that she basically said that there are, in uh, this particular case, there are two kinds of sources which were offering different con conflicting visions of, uh, of the past. One uh, was a set of Polish court records from 1950. Another was a Jewish testimony from 1990, so-called the Spielberg Foundation testimony, um, which is crucially important. Now, the judge basically said that if you are, con if a historian is confronted with such a situation that you have, uh, let's say, Jewish testimony and Polish court testimony, and they are at odds, you as a historian are unable, you are not authorized to build up a hypo hypothesis. You are basically, these sources are no longer um, allowing you to, to, to do something fundamentally important for each and every historian, uh, which is to advance one's own a hypothesis based on our evaluation of these sources. Now, the courts do not have information about the validity of these sources, as Natalia, you know very well, and most of you, you know that well too. So, for instance, if you have a testimony, a deposition uh, made in Polish court in 1950, it's a very peculiar kind of document which we appreciate, but we have to measure it on the face, on face value and reading between the lines. Then when you have a later testimony of Jewish survivor who is no longer in Poland, let's say, no longer subject to certain pressures about which we can talk later on, um, then of course we assign greater meaning to such a document, or we are, we were authorized. Now, should this verdict stand, we would not, we would lose this liberty. In other words, we could as well stop writing history of the Holocaust. Yes, I, I find it uh, truly shocking because it took, uh, this is now speaking not only about Poland, but it took decades for uh, Holocaust scholars uh, to uh, realize the potential of uh, basing research or incorporating Holocaust testimonies of survivors. Uh, and and um, it seemed to me uh, naively that uh, that shift uh, had taken place and following um, Gross's, Jan Gross's neighbors and scholarship published by the Polish Center for Holocaust uh, uh, Research in Warsaw that, you know, we, we, we all realized that um, that these are uh, invaluable sources that, of course, one evaluates critically. And in fact, in the volumes that were under such uh, attack, you do do it. I mean, I saw footnotes in which uh, authors of the, the, the nine historians actually say, well, this testimony appears to have some aspects that doesn't seem, do, do not seem to be uh, plausible. Uh, so this is not a priori acceptance of, uh, of Jewish accounts uh, by any uh, stretch. Uh, but I want to ask you about the findings and um, I mentioned before, the trial is only part of a campaign. Uh, um, most, I'm sure, most nerve wracking and, mm. and dangerous for, for Holocaust research, but uh, there were very vicious um, texts published and, and, and reviews. So what is uh, so unpalatable in the research that um, Javi, if you can show the book again, uh, that hopefully will be published in English um, as a night without end, hundreds and hundreds of uh, pages of uh, meticulous research by nine scholars. What emerges from these books? You know, uh, Natalia, before I jump in and answer your question right away, I will take the liberty of having the microphone. And uh, it just uh, came something I came back to me here, uh, talking about the importance of Jewish uh, sources, about uh, about testimony and about battle of memory, which rages in Poland. And as you will hear in, uh, in 10 days or so here in Lithuania as well, uh, in Ukraine and in Russia, let's not delude ourselves, and in Hungary on a different level. Um, so. In 
in Poland, what happened, it, it's not, not new, actually. Um, you have an important drive to create, I would say, I would call it late testimonies. In other words, nowadays, the government has actually pumped, I believe the number is 60 million zlotys, which is 60 million shekels. It is an impressive amount of money into a museum of national identity created in Toruń under the auspices of one um, Reverend Rydzik. Um, and if you, I'm not going on record to with uh, expressing my own opinion about that individual, you can find more on the web. Uh, however, uh, uh, Mr. Rydzik uh, has been um, uh, populating Polish history with accounts of courageous Poles saving the Jews by tens of thousands, okay? So you have this process of rewriting of history now uh, on steroids, basically injected with the Polish, by the Polish state to the tune of tens of millions of dollars, uh, creating ex nihilo, uh, a new kind of history. Now, I remember also, before I get to our findings, I remember several years ago, still when Poland was a democratic country, back in 2020, was it 11, 12, I don't remember, um, 10 years ago or so, um, one of those nationalistic websites, its name was Fronda, um, uh, published my portrait with the title Zig Heil Hergrabowski and comparing me to Goebbels. Um, and I remember I uh, sued that, uh, that was my first lawsuit in my life, actually, not a pleasant experience. And um, I won it and I got, let's say, satisfaction. However, the thing is that during this trial, that trial, the, uh, the lawyer representing my opponents uh, was very eminent Polish lawyer and ex-minister of justice, uh, Professor Michał Królikowski. He was representing uh, in, uh, this uh, this nationalistic website and and his argument in court was uh, why uh, why do you quote all these Jewish uh, sources don't you have Polish sources to quote um, and something very similar happened in the courtroom now when we heard the voice of a lawyer for the other side uh, casting doubt as to the value for instance the lawyer said she said, that, you know, this uh, Jewish woman, she changed her CV. I mean, look, uh, her CV in 1940-something is like this, and in 1940-something is like that. Well, how can you trust a witness who is changing her CV? I, if, you, if you know the history of the Holocaust, you, of course, know why the, why the Jews were changing their CVs. Uh, but this is coming back. So now about to, to answer, Natalia, your question, the findings. Well, most of all, our book is not about Poles, okay? Our book is about the Jews. Uh, but however, in Poland, let's say openly, very few people care about the Jews. Uh, the interest in Jews is hinging only, uh, or practically only, on their relations with Poles, or let's say on shedding light on Polish behavior or misbehavior. So, so the authorities uh, acting through their proxies or acting through their institutions, such as the notorious uh, Institute of National Remembrance, um, started to look only at these parts which were interesting for them, meaning whenever uh, as they said, good name of the Polish nation was uh, put to harm, as they thought. And here, of course, if you want to dig in, you will find enough material. So this what made the book absolutely impossible to stomach for the authorities and, I would say, for the nationalistic part of the Polish society, uh, for whom um, own history, as I often repeat, it's not history, it's a form of religious experience, okay? So if you do something which, let's say, strikes at the heart of your religion, you react not in a logical way, you react in an emotional way, and that's what they actually do. Um, so whenever we speak about the masses of Polish society taking part in absolutely horrifyingly brutal liquidations of the ghettos, right? Um, how many people took advantage of the German genocidal project and inserted themselves into that project, not because they loved the Germans, they were deeply opposed to Germans, but first of all, they had no love lust for the Jews, and second, there was anti-Semitism and there was economic opportunity. And then, of course, the entire situation with Jews in hiding. So the level of betrayal, that major, vast majority of Jews in hiding from the areas which we uh, analyzed 
has been delivered into the hands of the Germans by their Polish neighbors or outright killed in not so frequent, but also fairly frequent occasions. Um, and then we looked at the, you know, uh, that the organizations which were under German control, such as the Polish Blue Police, such as the Polish firefighting brigades, but these organizations in this particular Jewish file operated with extraordinary own agency. So the list of these uh, findings is, you know, long, long, long. And it simply triggered an explosion of uh, Polish officialdom, which you can see reverberating through the diplomatic corps, which became hyperactive, trying to trying to, to spread the, uh, the misinformation around the world about our work. And then, of course, the IP, the notorious, as I call it, IPN, and other institutions more recently, such as the uh, Pilecki Institute, for instance. But so, so this is the reaction to these findings. I want to come back to the institutions uh, um, in a moment, but something that I also found striking in what you were saying, um, this degree of continuity. Um, and if you look at the um, underground press, uh, you know, you mentioned the indifference and kind of looking at what was happening to the Jews really through the lens of Polish uh, understood as ethnic Polish Catholic uh, experience. and. In, uh, in, in, in many of the publications in which some degree of empathy is expressed, it's really expressed through this uh, uh, trope of what will the world say about us uh, that uh, such terrible things are happening um, on Pol Polish soil. So it, it's interesting how much that concern with the reputation uh, that is now being expressed um, really builds on um, on some some tropes from, from for, for decades. Uh, and I want to bring up, uh, this is a serious conversation, but I do want to bring up my really terrible high school history teacher uh, uh, from late 90s, so uh, late 80s, I'm dating here myself, uh, but just before the fall of communism. And uh, throughout the whole history course, he mentioned the Holocaust once. And it's quite interesting how. So the, the mention was that um, Polish um, underground uh, courageously stopped trains uh, bringing Jews to um, uh, death camps, uh, but the Jews coming from the West uh, refused to leave the trains uh, because they were so naive and didn't believe the um, heroic uh, Polish uh, fighters. And this was literally uh, the one uh, thing that, um, that students in a rather prestigious uh, Polish high school were able to learn. So this, again, this element of, of heroism um, um, is also has long, long roots in the in the discourse. But I want to um, go uh, go back to um, the question of the institutions, um, and I find it striking that in. Um, uh, 18 years ago, Institute of Nas National Remembrance published absolutely crucial two volumes uh, about Yedwabne, uh, Voku Yedwabnego, that I also hope one day will be translated. Um, and this is the same institution that plays a very important role in, um, in that usable useful nationalistic uh, version of, of uh, history of the Holocaust. So what do you think about the shift? What do you think about the role of, of IPN and other uh, state-funded institutions? And, and I do want to say at the same time, uh, before, I, before I give you the, the microphone back, that um, you know, there, there is a degree of ambivalence because on the one hand, you, we have Polish state institutions involved, but at the same time, the Center for Holocaust Research and uh, scholars that published in the um, uh, Night Without End, these are all uh, brave, courageous, um, uh, incredibly hardworking Polish historians. So this is a very complicated story, but uh, Jan. Yeah, I mean, uh, looking at these, you know, looking at these institutions, um, well, for instance, as you are quite correct to mention, well, in the, the volumes on Yedwabne, very, very important uh, pieces of scholarship, uh, 
and all co-authored by uh, by my friend uh, Dr. Persak, and they are an example of thorough uh, methodological uh, historical um, uh, study made with rigorous scrutiny. And um, now the thing is that. Uh, the problem is that if you create an institution such as the Institute of National Remembrance, which is, by the way, for those of you who do not know, a, a world scale unique phenomenon, not because of its mission. There are smaller things like that in Slovakia, something in Ukraine, in Russia as well. Uh, but this is uh, given the size and let's say toxic influence on Polish historiography with hundreds of uh, historians uh, employed by it. Uh, the problem is that you have here a potential of distorting a history of a nation because you the problem is that if you create a monster like that with hundreds of professional historians working basically according as as state employees right they are usually not competing for funds for instance as i am with my peers trying to find a dollar for my research right and um, they are being funded directly within projects created in the minds of people who are government in government or lower but in 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 positions of authority this is very this is a recipe for disaster so as long as it goes well it is a wonderful trip you, ha you have the resources However, I would say at the root of this attempt to write an official line of history, at the very root of it is the problem that will come to haunt us today. So in the beginning of the IPN, you have reasonable people working there and reasonable people, let's say, producing a reasonable or good books. Now, I have to tell you myself, I was uh, actually, I have a medal on my shelf in autumn. I have a medal of recognition that has been given to me well in, let's say, a bit of a secret, but by then chief of the uh, of the of of the public bureau of education in IPN, uh, Mr. Kaminski. Uh, so I have a medal for, as, as someone who is meritorious and uh, recognized for ten years of IPN's existence. Um, I might actually display it someday uh, in my uh, cabinet de curiosité. Uh, but um, uh, well, I was still co-organizing a conference uh, with with IPN in 2013. So the things went south, so to say, very quickly. And and especially once you have once you have the nationalistic takeover of the IPN, which is 2015, uh, once the nationalists uh, came to power, uh, one of their obsessions is, as you know, history, right? Uh, so they came with a broom. Uh, they they replaced uh, people who were, uh, let's say, not uh, welcome, and uh, they infused uh, not only this institution with new people, but most of all with new spirit. So, uh, so what you have is uh, IPN has become this uh, powerful, blunt tool to be used against people like the authors of uh, of uh, Night uh, Without End, like other historians who are employed. Uh, in the, but basically. Not surprisingly, historians dealing with minority issues, Ukrainian Polish history, Jewish Polish history, they found themselves at the receiving end of a powerful boot. So, so this is, and, and the current situation, when you have a neon, ex-neo-Nazi appointed to a position of authority, when you have uh, local, um, uh, local leaders, at this stage, you have an institution which is, uh, which is um, well, uh, a clear threat to, uh, to independent research of history. I'll try to restore my internet. Uh, so I was wondering, and I'm uh, looking at the clock so that we can also take questions from the audience, uh, but I was wondering what your take on... Um, now, what what do we do now is I hope that you're not planning to change your uh, field of research and write about you know local local soccer teams um, um, hopefully the research uh, will continue um, but there are very clear uh, um, aspects of of this campaign that um, that I believe will affect the field uh, in Poland and beyond. Uh, do you have any prescription of um, what uh, scholars and broader audience uh, can do uh, to yeah. support Holocaust research? Uh, so basically what happens now is, um, well, people who are senior historians, such as myself, such as I, 
uh, people who are based outside of Poland have, of course, more choices. Um, but the problem, of course, it remains what to do. The, uh, the authorities in Poland, in a way, uh, have, uh, have already uh, won this battle, I fear to say, because uh, the spectacle of, um, of us being dragged through courts uh, has had and will have an extraordinary uh, difficult, let's say, and paralyzing, chilling, um, chilling uh, impact on young scholars. That's for certain. Um, so, so uh, we don't know what will happen. But uh, even even senior scholars in this situation will have to rethink their, let's say, writing habits. Um, I wonder how many foreign scholars at this stage will want to uh, will want to. Um, uh, to publish their their uh, their books in Polish, knowing that they can find themselves at the receiving end of these uh, policies. So, um, uh, so this is a future is murky, and as a historian, I am usually not pronouncing myself about what will happen. Mm, I'm trying to evaluate my own uh, situation right now, and I'm still. Uh, you know, in a state of uh, confusion as far as my own situation is concerned. But uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is very worrisome. And for me, uh, the most dangerous aspect is, of course, the chilling effect on a young generation of scholars. Because, you know, Professor Alexion Plergrabowski can continue their work with more or less, uh, an, uh, let's say, assurance. Uh, but uh, our Polish younger colleagues uh, or MA students uh, facing choices, well, their situation is very, very different. Now, um, let me ask you more directly about um, what, uh, what can be done or how, what do you think the, the, the conduct uh, uh, should be? Uh, uh, we, we, you and I both know that there's a whole discussion about um, the conversation, and I even glam, glance here on the on the chat, and there is a there are some comments uh, pertaining to um, open conversation and suppressing different opinions and such. So, uh, uh, do you do you believe in uh, uh, discussing uh, this um, this matter, discussing the Holocaust scholarship and Holocaust history, um, or how do we how do we convey um how do you want to convey your research beyond the circle of scholars uh, to sort of counter uh, that uh, that um, vision of history that uh, smooths over things that might be uh, painful for um, national pride and such well, uh, one thing is what we do right now is uh, is perhaps a part uh, is a part of the answer too. Um, uh, due to uh, modern technology, we can we can do things which were absolutely impossible uh, not a long uh, time ago. Um, uh, however, uh, in terms of <clears throat> in terms of uh, um, our presence uh, in Poland, the absolutely crucial part is beyond our uh, reach. In other words, uh, I am deeply saddened by the fact that practically nothing of what I have written over the last quarter of a century or the, uh, or the people from the Center for Holocaust Research or other independent historians, practically nothing of these findings has ever penetrated into school curricula. Uh, has never been actually, you know, uh, um, uh, made available uh, on the level of people who do not go to bookstores looking for history books, right? Uh, so the and uh, one day when uh, let's say Poland becomes uh, a normal state again, when we do a post mortem of what happened during last six years here, um, uh, this part which I will probably be more most uh, interested in will be. Uh, an attempt to, to make an impact on the level of schools, what and how the children are being and youth are being taught. Because now if you see, if you look at the polls, it is absolutely depressing. Uh, if you see the polls which were recently uh, re released uh, stating that 70 percent of poll the polls in Poland today think that uh, Poles and Jews suffered equally during the German occupation or Poles suffered more. And when you look at this most recent poll which says that 40 percent of Poles uh, agree that historians who 
a slander, good name of the Polish, who talk about Polish complicity in the Holocaust should face charges in court. Uh, and the, the question was not even about people who were uh, telling, uh, telling lies, people who were telling the truth. Uh, so this is, uh, these signs of deep, deep malaise make me think that, you know, writing history and leaving it on the, on the bookshelves uh, in academic bookstores is good, but we need to do way more in the future, if possible. I, I fully agree. And, and I wonder, uh, going back to um, the question of uh, survivors' uh, accounts, um, I wonder what you think about the, the power of these accounts. Maybe, uh, may, here I'm, I'm really just thinking about my own experience as a young, uh, young uh, aspiring student of history uh, many decades ago in Warsaw. Uh, encountering these sources and being absolutely shocked by why what I was finding. Uh, and I wonder if maybe this is a way to um, to make an impact. Uh, and I think that this is what uh, uh, Night Without End in, to a large extent was doing, meaning telling individual stories. Uh, there, there are no collective really statements uh, as such. This is not 900 pages of the Jews and the Poles, but rather concrete people with their neighbors, uh, with uh, night watch, uh, watchers, with firefighters, uh, with um, loyal, um, loyal friends and disloyal friends. Uh, what do you think about this as a way to to kind of break this um, vicious circle. Well, the thing is here that uh, that <clears throat> if you uh, some time ago, uh, my friend uh, Professor Gross uh, mentioned that uh, there is a a very powerful way in which one can make an impact. Uh, you are, most of, uh, some of you are aware of the existence of so-called 301 um, uh, testimonies. Those are extremely, extremely short uh, um, uh, Jewish testimonies deposited or given uh, in Poland just after the Holocaust has ended, okay? These people just wanted to convey uh, what happened to them, to their close ones to their communities. There was no issue of restitution or court, uh, court files. It was just a cry of uh, despair. And uh, these uh, documents, we have few th several thousands of them. So Jan Tomasz Gross uh, said that, look, if we, let's take good actors and each morning in a radio, read one page long testimony or read by a very well-spoken actor or someone who is a celebrity, and this perhaps might shake people to their cores. And I believe that this is the way really to, uh, one of the things we could do because these testimonies are something much more powerful than any kind of, uh, of, of uh, let's say, academic book that we can produce. Yeah, I, see, I, I agree. And I was thinking in particular about this uh, issue of uh, the righteous among the nations and part of the vocabulary of um, of Polish, uh, well, again, of this history account, which uh, stresses um, uh, Polish uh, heroism, uh, there's always, uh, if not in the first sentence, then in the second or third, there is the number of the righteous and Poland winning the content contest for the most trees at Yad Vashem. And it becomes really a way to deal with all the other complexities of, uh, of uh, um, Jewish experiences and Polish Jewish experiences during the Holocaust. And if you look at the, you know it uh, uh, just as well, uh, if you look at 301 collection, there are so many of the testimonies in which survivors actually talk about help they received, and then they also note that they would not give the name of people who, hel who helped them because it could harm uh, these people it, or they, that their uh, helpers ask them to please not uh, reveal uh, their names. And uh, I think it, it would be, it could be a very interesting and maybe uh, a productive way to convey the complexity of that part of the discussion uh, about the Holocaust uh, as well. That even when you look through this uh, part of the history, which is about help, uh, which is about courageous 
uh, individuals taking great risks. Um, it's wrapped up in, in a lot of, of gray uh, zone uh, questions. Um, I would love to leave some time uh, for questions. So Medin, if you can take over from now, uh, picking some questions that maybe Jan could take. Okay, of course. Um, first of all, thank you both. Um, <laughs> intriguing discussion. And I think that really uh, the best way to approach this type of um, discussion is, is to invite two historians, that this is their profession, this is their life work and outside of the, the courts and to have a real debate and a real discussion. Um, actually, I wanna start with uh, a question from a young scholar, because one of the things that we talked about was, okay, what is the future for uh, young Polish uh, scholars in Poland and um, and what he actually is asking, actually it's, a, it's Amanda, so it's a, a, a female scholar. First of all, she says, thank you for the discussion. And uh, she was actually doing, she's a second year master's student uh, in Krakow and she is doing her thesis research on the, listen, on the collective memory of the Holocaust in contemporary Poland and particularly how the situation for Holocaust scholarship has deteriorated under a PIS-led Poland through the historical policy program and the civil ramifications. Uh, so I wanted to ask you if you have any advice for young scholars like myself working on this topic in Poland. Um, and also uh, she wanted to ask um, any postulations on the impact of you and Professor Engel King's trial on the future of Holocaust scholarship in Poland for young scholars, as well as the effects on collective memory more broadly. So those are two questions from a young scholar. Mm. Uh, well, you know that to, to respond to this question is, uh, nowadays I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate this question from this young person from Krakow. And the thing is, I don't have an advice. The thing is that I cannot in a good conscience advise anyone, especially, you know, sitting from my nice perch at University of Ottawa, uh, what they should do in the context of a minute of grants, for instance, being given out uh, by a ministry of uh, education being now led by a minister uh, who claims that uh, I quote here directly uh, that LGBT people are less than normal human beings, right? So the climate has changed and what you do is have to, has, to be, has to depend on your own choice and your own evaluation of situation. Um, I would be amiss, I would be, it would be wrong uh, for me uh, to suggest that you should continue to be brave and struggle uh, because it's not my position to do so. So basically the situation is of course difficult. You have to be able that to, to you, you see how difficult the situation is. I hope you will make the right choices and that's all I can say in this situation. <laughs> Um, actually, there's another question of, specifically about the trial and the appeal. First of all, someone was asking if you could elaborate a little bit about the 1950s uh, testimony that was used in the trial in 2021. Um, sure. We wanted to know about yeah. that. And then I have another question as well. Okay, I will just quickly go to it. A 1950s um, uh, trial is uh, the as a historian who has uh, made his way through, I would say, close to 1,000 of these trials in the course of last 15 years. And um, uh, these trials are, um, uh, are, I call them orphan trials because nobody wants them actually. Um, the authorities don't want them because they don't want to be seen as uh, communist lackeys and Jewish lackeys, sorry. Um, uh, the people of local village don't want to see them either. The Jews are are gone. And so these trials have two, uh, from historical methodological point of view, have two parts. One is the early deposit, or early investigation, when people are usually telling what has happened. And then you have the part when they go to trial and they go to court. And that's when they change their story because the community comes together and the pressure sets in. And that's when the terrorized Jewish witnesses, if there are any, in this case, there were three, um, who are being, there is squeeze being put on and they will, uh, they will tell whatever the community wants them to say. 
And so this is the way I personally attach huge importance to early investigation of each August trial. I attach practically no, no very little uh, significance to the trial and out outcome. Uh, but this is you know, a question of vast experience and years and years of work with these documents. And there is no, these are regular courts. There are no, they, these are not political trials. Right, and so the second question, and it's come up with a few people in our audience, Asking in the appeal, will historians be invited to give testimony? Uh, someone wrote for especially will historians specializing in methodology be consulted in the appeal trial? How will crucial issues of who interprets historical documents be addressed? Well, I fear that my knowledge of Polish um, uh, civil procedure is not as profound as it probably will be in the course of next year. Uh, however, uh, from what I know, um, uh, there is uh, little chance actually of, uh, of new evidence and testimony being added because the appeals process basically looks at what has happened uh, in, during the first phase of trial and uh, can only focus on alleged or real and um, let's say departures of the judge from the uh, from the procedure. Okay, so uh, most likely there will not be any new elements brought into the mix. Although once again, I am no expert here. Okay, and actually, there's a very interesting question here. We talked about the future of uh, uh, Holocaust scholars, especially in Poland, but not only the implications. But someone is asking about the archives. Do you believe, both of you, that maybe archives are now in danger, that maybe there will be a monitoring of the um, archives or even a closing of the archives? Uh, you may need to have a, a special uh, ID to get in. So that's a very important question. Do you, can, do you foresee anything happening with uh, being able to access archives in the future? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Natalia, would you like? Well, it, it's it's a great question, and and a little bit like Jan said, it's uh, it's slightly out of my expertise to uh, to foresee uh, the future. Uh, I must say that personally, every time, well, minus Corona, but every time I made it to IPN archive and. Uh, my archive of choice was the IPN branch in Wrocław, uh, where the um, uh, um, person who was a, 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 at the center of a scandal uh, was temporarily appointed a director. Um, every time I was I was there, I, I felt like I need to uh, you know see as many files as possible um, uh, before. Uh, before one will need to declare some kind of, you know, right approach uh, before one can um, access material. Uh, so far, it seems that um, um, historians um, that have been uh, publicly criticized uh, for what they write um, have been receiving uh, files, but um, this is a question of how, um, how well uh, will this process of um, silencing um, um, or conveying a subtle message that certain ways of writing are not welcome, how well it will also uh, affect the practical things. Um, Jan, please tell me you're more optimistic. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> actually I am, I went even, even a few, a few days ago, I was uh, working in the archives of Warsaw office of the IPN and uh, there were some people curiously eyeing me from behind the from behind the glass partition, but uh, I was given access to what I wanted. Uh, however, um, uh, let's say uh, I already know that certain scholars try to uh, uh, try to uh, give different topics of their study to archival uh, staff in order to avoid the silly questions. So instead of let's say writing that your topic uh, of interest is Polish-Jewish relations, you can write, for instance, Polish society under the occupation, mm. uh, which is not. Not untrue. Uh, it is not quite true, um, but uh, and there is also um, well, it future will show. But probably, you know, if uh, uh, if uh, some of us who are better known or more targeted by the authorities show up in different archives, probably local directors will be, you know, reluctant or fearful. Uh, but that remains to be seen. That remains to be seen. It's That's actually a question that you were just asked by uh, another scholar. Uh, Holocaust scholar Beverly Chalmers also asked how difficult has this experience been for you personally, but also how will it influence your work moving forward? So for now, I understand that you're, you're moving forward. 
Well, in my in my case, I the thing is that uh, that the authorities in their um, I mean, I'm not going to tell more than I should here, but in their um, very arrogant approach to scholars, um, have forgotten that actually we are a small group of uh, Holocaust scholars and we are really committed to what we do. And the thing is that um, it is not that we will stand up one day and say, look, I'm tomorrow I'm turning to something quite different and something else. Um, working, uh, studying, the, researching and studying the Holocaust is a full-time job. And I mean, full-time job means 24 hours per day. Um, uh, and uh, and there is of course uh, uh, and this the 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 authorities should nationalistic authorities should um, uh, understand that uh, it is not uh, someone who is going to retool himself in order to repair you know not uh, uh, small uh, small craft but uh, smaller cars. Uh, this is a question of a life obligation and commitment. Actually, there is a question. I, I think this is maybe also the heart of the whole concept of, of having a historical scholarship put on trial. Uh, someone is asking, uh, was it raised in the trial, the difference between historical truth and judicial, judicial and legal truth? Um, did the court discuss the limits of the court in dealing with historical truth? No, actually, it was uh, in the trial. It was very. <clears throat> it, there were very few elements of any kind of expert uh, expert opinion, um, uh, other than uh, so. So th uh, there were no actually experts uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, place it into a wider in a wider context. So this decision was, uh, let's say, based on. Um, on uh, depositions uh, and uh, uh, that the court heard from from Professor Engel King, myself, uh, and so on. But um, but there was no larger context definitely offered in court. So you know, we'll see how it plays out. Okay. Um, actually, there's another question. Uh, if I try to put the questions together, uh, how is not really how the, the Polish community is reacting to this, but more someone wrote about the Polish Roman Catholic Church. Have they said anything publicly, publicly about this? We know what's going on around the world and there's a reaction, academics are reacting, but within Poland itself, what kind of organizations, or like we have here, the uh, Roman Catholic Church are declaring some sort of statement against what was happening and what happened in the court decision? Jan knows, and, and um, uh, many of you uh, uh, that are present with us know that uh, various extremely important and prestigious professional organizations, including Israeli uh, organizations, American uh, and Canadian uh, organizations, uh, spoke uh, about it before the, uh, the, the court pronounced its judgment. Uh, uh, appealing to uh, to have uh, freedom of academic research uh, defended, um, Polish uh, academic institutions uh, were uh, much uh, uh, shyer, uh, um, and um, although there were some voices institutionally, organizationally raised, um, in terms of uh, Catholic Church. Uh, no, I, I think I'm in a, some sort of a bubble uh, because I, I am uh, in conversation and following uh, some um, very liberal thinking, uh, open-minded uh, members of the, of the uh, clergy. Um, but of course, um, uh, the overarching, uh, the overarching institutional uh, stance is very much in line. Um, and here I think I'm being gentle. Yes, you are being very gentle indeed. I mean, the Polish Catholic Church has aligned itself uh, uh, with the uh, with the current authorities, uh, uh, if not 190 percent, definitely. And uh, and uh, well, but this is probably you know ex this extends beyond the frame of our of our conversation. Um, because we did not, uh, we researchers did not really hope for church's support. Um, uh, quite to the contrary, uh, let's say uh, their indifference uh, would be uh, more than welcome. And uh, so, no, by and large, uh, Polish Catholic Church uh, is now very closely aligned with the authorities. And if you look at, uh, at statements made in so-called Radio Maria or TV Trfam, which is a voice of a part, a significant part of Polish Catholic Church, uh, this is uh, plain awful. Um, so. 
If I if I can, Rodin, if I can uh, ask a question that was asked some by someone, I it actually is probably a few pages up on the yeah. chat. But um, if we have another moment, um, there was a question about how the situation affects uh, uh, research uh, in into uh, Jewish history uh, uh, beyond the Holocaust. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think that, uh, thank you, uh, whoever asked this question, it's, it's very important, uh, if I may get us started, that this, of course, uh, is not only affecting uh, historians of the Holocaust. And uh, some scholars have understood it, that this is a matter that will come to those who uh, write about uh, uh, early 20th century and 19th century, uh, because it has to do with a particular vision of, of, of national history. Um, and so if I can uh, just in, in inject a personal anecdote, a few years ago, I received a, a very strangely worded letter from a Canadian uh, organization of uh, emigre Poles, uh, which attacked me for citation in a journalistic article um, pertaining to a ghetto benches at Jagiellonian University, um, the uh, assigned seats to Jewish students that were introduced in the late 30s, um, and claiming that this is slandering the good name of the university, slandering, of course, the good name of uh, Polish nation. Now, in the archives of the said Jagiellonian universities, there are images, uh, drawings of uh, uh, by by pencil for each uh, room where classes were held with uh, marked seats where uh, those considered Jewish were to seat and uh, sit and where non-Jews were to be uh, seated. So th there is material evidence uh, 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 page after page after page of uh, of not just calls for introducing ghetto benches signed by students, but uh, but documents uh, working practicalities of this. And uh, I, you know, again, I was young and naive, and I was completely. Um, uh, struck. Why would someone deny uh, such? obvious uh, historical fact and consider it as a slander. So uh, Jan, what do you think about this broader uh, vision of, of and implications for research? Well, you know, the thing is that, uh, that if once the state uh, has uh, uh, in its toolbox a hammer, it will use it. Uh, and uh, and uh, the thing is actually that even many democratic uh, regimes uh, have these tendencies to look, you know, at these uh, tools of uh, forceful persuasion. So, of course, yes. I mean, the thing is that once, if you have the tools in your toolbox to suppress uh, research, which you find uh, not to your liking, more likely than not, uh, it will shall be used in the future. Uh, and, you know, topics can change. It can deal with, uh, with, with gays or lesbians, with Jews or Ukrainians. Uh, I have uh, my fun, your fantasy is, you know, basically uh, it can, can, can trace the limits of it. So, yes, I, I am pretty certain that uh, implications are far reaching. And if someone today thinks that it strikes against few people who are writing uncomfortable history, well, that person is wrong because it strikes at everybody. Actually, in our uh, chat box, and we were debating whether or not to bring this up, but since somebody did bring it up in the chat box, one of our guests about um, uh, Belarus and about Novogodok, uh, the director, Tamara Vyshyskaya, uh, has lost her job as a founding curator of the museum. Uh, and so we're also following her story as well. And there, uh, the question is, do we see this as an Eastern European problem or oh, is the no. <laughs> no we are look i mean the thing is that we took for granted for all these decades we took for granted that we are basically a model for the world we i mean democracies no right. we are not and if you look at what happens in china in turkey i mean we are basically small islands which are being slowly uh, submerged and i don't want i mean i usually i usually am 
and so uh, the Cassandric voice here, but uh, but the, the evidence is pretty overwhelming, right? Um, so we should really treasure what we have and fight hard for each and every inch of our liberties that we do have because they are not given for, for good. They are being taken away in many, many places in the world. I think I, there's, I do want to ask one more question before we uh, finish today. Somebody's asking about the, re the response of the Jewish community in Poland, which I think is an interesting uh, question as well. How is the Jewish community within Poland uh, responding uh, to what is happening? Natalia. Yeah. Um, it's divided. I divided. think that's the, it's the fair uh, answer. Um, um, I mean, there were there were statements made by Bnei Brit, for example, very strong statement in in support of uh, of uh, Professor Engel King and and Professor Grabowski and and the whole matter of trying historians uh, for uh, for research uh, uh, findings, uh, but. Um, but uh, it's not uh, it's not as simple as it might seem. Just like the Polish, uh, you know, the Polish non-Jewish uh, responses are divided, um, and so I mean, I would love to say that the community is standing uh, behind um, um, Holocaust uh, scholars, uh, hundred percent and hundred ten percent, but uh, um, but it's more complicated than that. It's absolutely more complicated than that. And I see what's happening in uh, liberal art schools in America and uh, the attacks there as well. Um, I want to thank our guests, uh, Professor Natalia Lekshun and Professor Jan Grabowski, my professor, uh, for coming to uh, use our platform at the Ghetto Fighters House with the help of uh, Tel Aviv University and Javi Dreyfus uh, to, to bring this uh, program together really like everybody else, as quickly as possible to make sure that we have this uh, voice available and to, uh, to try to process what is happening right now. I think what is happening with Professor Grabowski and uh, Professor Engel King is a sign of the times and we have to be very dil diligent and to keep our eyes open and our ears open and our hearts open and to keep communicating with each other and to know that we have each other to support each other, but also to know that we can use this platform to, to give a voice to uh, Holocaust scholarship, which all hold so dearly in our hearts and in our minds. So thank you again, everybody, to our guests that were here today and participated and asked questions. There are many, many people writing, thank you, and you're, you're brave and you're courageous and keep going. And of course you have all the support uh, from many, many scholars that I see writing right now, so. Thank you very much for this invitation. Yes. Thank you, Jan. Thank, Thank you, you Ghetto Fighters House. Thank, Thank you, you both. Thank you, bye-bye.